an incredible reality. Now, if you take Corinthians chapter 3, and we, we won't do this completely today, but if you take Corinthians chapter 3 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and you bring them together, which is completely right to do, we're talking about the judgment seat of Christ. We're talking about that time when we will stand before the righteous judge and everything will come under the review. The Bible says, and here in Corinthians 3, it will come under the fire of God and it will be tested. And for you and I, it's yet future. The judgment seat of Christ in terms of eschatology, the doctrine of last things, is that really we're waiting for the rapture to happen, but then soon after the rapture, we will stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ, and we will be judged according to our works. So now we're talking about a different angle, the idea that we would continue with responsibility. It's not just some good, you know, happy idea. It's not just some random thought. It's not just some, you know, good idea. We're talking about something that God expects from us and ultimately will hold us all accountable to in terms of our work and our labor in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why that verse in, in the, here in chapter 3, verse 14 says, If any man's work abide. If is a major word in the scripture, isn't it? I mean, if is that, it could go either way. You know, it's like 1 John 1, 9. You know the verse on confession? If we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But, but if you don't confess, then there is no forgiveness and cleansing. And by the way, he's talking to believers. He's not talking to lost men. He's talking to his children. So now, if you, it's conditional. If you do this, then I'm going to do that. And if any man's work abide. Referencing the idea that there's options on our part. That there's some options for our choice that we can either do it God's way or kind of do it our own way. And then we find ourselves really disappointed. I mean, who wants to stand before God and be disappointed? John, the great disciple, the great apostle wrote in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, he said, I, I want to make sure that I'm not ashamed before the Lord at his coming. I don't want to be ashamed. I don't want God to show up. And he's like, Andy, what are you doing? Where have you been? Where's your mind? Where's your feet? Where's your hands? Where's your motive? Where's your mind? Where's your money? Right? Where's your family? Where's your walk with God? I don't want to stand before God and God like, you know, this has been all a waste. There's nothing left. I mean, your life has gone up in flames because your work did not remain. And we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is an incredible, incredible truth. Now, I want to bring a few other scripture thoughts to mind. I hold your finger in 1 Corinthians there. And I want you to turn over to Philippians chapter 1. And I want you to see something that really, I think is just incredible. And we talk about working for God, and uh, let's just be honest, I'm really glad, oh, how do I say that? Uh, I, I'm really glad that I am not in a, a doctrinal instruction, I'm trying to be really careful, doctrinal instruction that puts the responsibility of my salvation into my works. Do we believe in works? Absolutely. Do we believe in works for salvation? No, absolutely not. Do we believe in works to maintain your salvation security? Absolutely not. And I'm thankful that we're not in a part of a Christian religion that teaches me that unless you live a certain way, you're, still, you're not going to still be saved. I'm grateful that my security is in the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm very grateful for that. That releases me just a little bit. It releases me to do work that God has asked me to do with a pure heart. Rather than being like God is a vengeful God and every little step or misstep that I take, I've lost something in return. God's like, no, please understand the motivation is your pure heart to do what God wants you to do. Now, I began to learn something through Bible study. It's here in Philippians chapter 1 if you're there. And it's in that sixth verse uh, that, that we find an incredible, incredible truth. I think I can quote it, but I don't want to misquote 
And he which hath begun a good work in you, Adam, I butchered it up. Being confident of this very thing, verse 6 of chapter 1 of Philippians, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until when? The day of Jesus Christ. Now, I learned something as a young believer and through discipleship, and I learned that the moment I got saved as a 10 year old boy, God went to work in me. Now, I, as any 10 year old boy with three older brothers, me and the Lord had a few conversations, and I told him a couple things. I said, Derek, Alan, and Darren need more work than I do. <laughs> Is there any man on that? I was with my brothers this week. We had the chance to be together, and, and my mom was there. We, we took a, a picture. We don't get to do that very often, and, and um, my, had such a joy with my brothers sitting around. We just visited like we were talking yesterday, and it's easy to pick, kind of pick up where we left off, and, and I sit around the table with my brothers. Who are, here we are now all in our, uh, just about in our 50s and, and kind of reviewing back. You know how that works, and a little bit of nostalgia coming on, and, and all that we've been through. And, uh, and quite honestly, I, I review my personal life. I'm so thankful that God has me where I'm at. I'm so thankful that God has done a work in me. God went to work sharpening, or rather shaving off the sharp edges of my life. I mean, God went to work. He's like, Andy, your mind is defiled. Your mind is corrupt. And your mind is broken. It needs some repair. And I said to God, no, it doesn't. My mind is fine. He says, example, case in point. <laughs> You think you're right and you think I'm wrong, you're wrong. And at some point I had to come to grips with that. That God would have the freedom to do what he says. In one little verse in the Bible, God blows us away. He says, I have begun a work and I will perform it in you until the day of Jesus Christ. By the way, to make no mistake, the day of Jesus Christ hasn't arrived yet. It's none other than what we might call the rapture and or the day, the plan of God for his children. We've referred to that time period as the day of Christ. Oh, that time when God's blessings come to fruition. That time when all that God has planned, yet future. By the way, at some point, we're going to take a tour of our mansion. Amen. We're going to somehow, I don't know how it's all going to happen. We get to heaven. The Lord's going, hey, come on, Andy. Let's go, let's go take a look. Here is the place that I had prepared for you. What do you think? And I'm going to be like, you know, I, I really would have chosen those colors. <laughs> yeah, come on. I, mean, I, I really I would have chosen a different floor plan, you know. I need a few more square feet. You're right. I mean, God is somehow God's like, come on, let's take a look. I've been working on this forever, you know, and here you go. I'm like, Lord, that's an amazing blessing. I can't wait to possess my place in heaven where God's been preparing. But it won't happen until the day of Christ. Until then, God is continuing to work. I've been saved going on 38 years and uh, I've been in the ministry for, uh, I don't even know now, almost 30. And... Uh, uh, I mean, we've come a long ways. I mean, I feel like the Lord has done a good work in my life. But please understand, we're not even close. I mean, I'm not even close. There's no way that I understand all of God's Word. Uh, and by the way, this is just a little bitty drop in the bucket of all that God wants us to understand about Him. I mean, this is just a, this is just a flash in the pan when it comes to all there is to know about God and understand Him. And I, I barely, I struggle all the time studying and praying and reading and meditating all the things we're supposed to do. We work hard and God has done a work to reveal Himself to us and yet we're still not quite there. Now remember, it's an interesting thing. God went to work and what we find in verse 6 of Philippians is that God is still at it. God is continuing he didn't say, I'm going to continue, I'm going to work and work in you until you sin again. That would have stopped a long time ago. He didn't say, I'm going to continue to work in you until you reach a certain level and then you're going to be on your own. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I'm going to do a work in you until you give enough money to the church and to my cause and then I'm going to turn you out to pasture. He didn't say that. 
He said, I'm going to work this work in you until the day of Christ. Now, here's one thing I've learned about the work of God. God expects me to do much of what he is doing as well. Is that right? Now, by the way, I'm not God. We're not God. We're not deity. We don't have the powers and all those kind of things in that reference. But at the same time, I've read what James said. He said, don't be hearers of the word only, but what? Doers as well. He also said in the second chapter, if you say you have faith, I'm going to show you my faith by my what? My works. And the concept of working for the Lord, one of the works of God is to get you working. One of the works of God is to get you moving. Now we know that. We have incredible thought about the idea of the workings of God. What we find in Corinthians chapter 3 is this incredible story unfolding in the work of God to prepare us to do the work that he's asked us to do and that we would do it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, my, my dad, my mom, for my lifetime, uh, told me a few things. My, my mom and dad expected, my mom just turned 80, and my dad has been in heaven now for a few years. And, but my mom and dad would talk like this. We believe we're going to be alive when the Lord comes back. By the way, how many of you believe that? You see, here's the thing. If we're continuing in the expectation of the Lord's return, he might come back today. You better be ready. And we believe he'll come when he's ready. Certainly we do. And we live accordingly. We live according to the concept that God's going to come. And so God clearly has done a work. Now, here I stand today after all these years. And the thought is, you know what? I still believe that the Lord will come during my lifetime. Everything is set. Everything is ready. All that God wants to accomplish in the world is done. Everything that God needs to do is set. Everything is there. What we're just now preaching to the world is that you believe in Christ or you suffer the consequences of eternal loss and death and hell. Everything is set. But it comes down to some learning on our part. As a young boy here in Dr. Sears, preach. I was motivated. I, I, I can't explain it. The, the Lord just uh, just opens our hearts. By the way, Dr. Sears, he was just a regular dude that, that you know, God used. But in the end, we're moved by God to learn what he says. Now in Corinthians, we find a few things. First of all, we need to make sure that we build on the correct foundation. Now, if you look at this, if any man's work abide, here in Corinthians, what we discover is the work of building. Matter of fact, a word that we find in Scripture that is consistent here is the idea of edification. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edification of the body of Christ. Our building, our, our working to build our lives. Pick it up in verse number 10 of uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he builds thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is who? Jesus Christ. Here's one of the things you need to worry about as you continue working for God. Make sure you build on the right foundation. Now that implies a couple of simple things, and, and right here's where we want to insert the gospel. The gospel can be inserted into the scripture at any verse, at any point. Here's the truth, that you cannot build on the foundation of Jesus Christ in your life if you are not saved. It implies relationship. It implies that Christ is part of your life. The Bible phrases are, it's Christ in you and you in Christ. That's the biblical description of your relationship with God. And Paul says we, we need to make sure that we build on this foundation and the foundation is none other than Jesus Christ. So whatever you do, make sure it lines up with the instructions of Jesus Christ. Now here's, let's take that a little more practical. Uh, here's where we get the idea and we find the biblical truth that whatever your career choice in life. I've often thought, what if I wasn't a pastor? What would I be doing? 
And um, all through the years, I get a little older, thing, you know, it's changed a little bit. But I thought, well, what if I wasn't a pastor? What would I be doing? Here's the thing. It doesn't matter what you do. Your career choice is really irrelevant. It's irrelevant. What matters is that you live in the choices of your life and you do it in such a way that you're doing the work of Christ built on his teachings. Now, the Bible says no other foundation. Paul said, I, I've laid the foundation, and the foundation can't be changed. The Bible says that we're built on the apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. In other words, the foundation is set, and anything outside of that really is irrelevant. It's really not going to last. Can I say that a little more pointed with, with a lot of grace involved? It doesn't matter whether you're a fireman, an engineer, a construction worker, a school teacher. doesn't matter whether you're in the computer and IT type side of work. doesn't matter whether you're a caregiver. doesn't matter whether you're a nurse, a doctor, a barber, a grocery store clerk. It doesn't matter whether you're an accountant. It does not matter what you do. In the end, you'll be defined by what you build upon Christ in those endeavors. Are you with me on that? Let me say that a little different way. Maybe it'll be a little more clear as well. Because it's not really not about the career choice. Here's the deal. If you're an engineer and you're not concerned about sharing the gospel in some way, it ain't going to last. You see, engineering and your career choice, a fireman, a worker, an accountant, a nurse, it doesn't matter. Whatever you are, that's nothing more than an avenue at some point God is responsible or putting response on you to say, you must do what I ask you to do, and that includes sharing the gospel. So, Brother Andy, they'll fire me if I share the gospel. Well, then find a way around it. Better to obey God than obey men. Come on now, is that right or not? I'm not, I'm not saying run around and get yourself fired. I'm not saying be deceptive. I'm just saying have some courage and find, be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove, and trust the leadership of God on your career choice to build something on the foundation of Christ that will last the duration of time. And in the end, being wise about how to share the gospel on your job matters. By the way, if you work at the, as a teenager, you work at the, at the movie theater, you work at a, at a fast food restaurant, find some way in your career choice to build upon the foundation of Christ and no other foundation will matter, no other foundation will count. A second point is simply this. God tells us to continue to build with correct materials. There's an incredible illustration of the wise man that built his house upon the rock and the foolish man that built his house upon the sand. We might even consider the foundation as part of the material. Consider the materials that we do. Now, the Bible says here in verse number 12, Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. It, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Did you capture that connection? God said he'll try every man's work of what sort it is. It's either gold, silver, precious stone, or wood, hay, and stubble. When God puts the fire to your work, it'll either burn up or it will survive. We all know that gold and silver and precious stone is actually purified by fire. And God will certainly, if you will, purify the works. He'll prove them to be worthy. But God makes it very clear. Be wise. Continue to build your life and serve God with proper materials. Gold and silver and precious stone simply represent the, the materials, the works in Scripture that God has chosen. Wood, hay, and stubble simply represent the works that men choose to serve God. Again, um, 
Well, let's be very clear. The choice of material, something's going to survive and something is not. And I, I've kind of made, uh, in a sense, light of it in some years gone by. I want to be careful. God needs us to serve him and serve his purpose. But ultimately, I don't think we're going to stand before God and determine whether or not we put the chairs out, whether that's going to survive very long. Nobody can say they've served God by putting chairs out and neglecting the gospel. Nobody can say I've served God because I baked cookies for the fundraiser and yet I've neglected the issues of discipleship. Nobody can say that. Nobody can say that, that I, I've served God by donating money to youth camp every year for the kids to go to camp, and yet I have neglected my responsibility of using my spiritual gift in the framework of the local church. No one can say that. By the way, we, we like your cookies. And, and we certainly have to have money to help the kids go to camp. And we like our chairs being where they're at. But let's be honest, some of that is wood, hay, stubble, and others of that is gold, silver, precious stone. And we want to make sure that we're building our life. If you're looking at your life being pleasing to God based on things you've chosen in which to serve God and neglected very clear biblical instruction on other works to perform, chances are you're going to be disappointed. You're going to be disappointed. So we've got to make sure we need to continue with proper materials before the Lord. And the wise man built his house on the rock and make sure that he served God in the ways that God chose for him to serve. Hey, let me give you a few examples. Galatians chapter 5 says it this way. Walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of who? the flesh. Walk in the spirit. There's a very clear foundational truth to your materials of which you choose to build. One is called spirit. One is called flesh. If you choose fleshly materials, if, in other words, if you use your voice for God and you're more concerned about men's applause for you, chances are it's going to burn up. Is that correct? Let me talk about preachers for just a minute, because a lot of preachers are very arrogant. They are very arrogant. They think they're God's gift to people. Please understand, we don't need most of them. <laughs> and the issue is this. Preachers who think they're God's gift to people become very arrogant in their preaching, and in the end, the preaching becomes nothing in their life. You with me on that? What, what if preaching is not based on biblical truth? What about preaching that is man-made? You see, spirit versus flesh. You might be a Sunday school teacher, but don't do it in the flesh. You might be a great soul winner, but don't do it in the flesh. Do it in the spirit. There's another issue of gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble. How about doctrine versus tradition? The Bible makes it very clear that the doctrines of Christ, we are built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. What that means is that we need to love his commandments. Amen. And we need to reject the idea that men's traditions become doctrine. Read Matthew chapter 15. The Lord, Lord took the Pharisees and raked them right over the righteous coals of heaven. He said, you, you have taken your traditions and you've taught them as the doctrines of God. And you've deceived people. We're more concerned about our traditions at times. We're more concerned about upholding what we've always done rather, rather than preaching the truth to people. Come on now. Well, I'm not... I don't mean to be condemning. I, I, God's speaking to all of us here this morning. I mean, what are we doing in church? What is church about? What are we preaching? What are we singing about? What are we fellowshipping about? What are we praying for? And ultimately it comes down to the doctrine and teachings of Jesus Christ and not the traditions of men. That's a wood, hay, stubble, gold, silver, precious stone. There are several examples of that in the scripture and so God makes it very clear continue to build with the correct materials in your life how about a third point and that's simply this how about we continue to build for the duration of time look at verse number 13 
Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. It will be revealed by fire. I don't quite understand the judgment seat of Christ. And I think there's a lot of confusion about this day. Philippians 1, 6 made it very clear it's the day of Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 10, makes it very clear that we're talking about the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ is a part of the day of Christ. And at that judgment, many believers are confused to think it's going to be the judgment of sin. Please understand, your sin was paid for on Calvary. Amen. Your sin was paid for by on Calvary, and it became effective in your life the moment you believed on Jesus Christ. What that means then, the judgment seat of Christ is not about your sin. The judgment seat of Christ is about your work and your work for the Lord. What that means is, if God's going to continue His work until the day of Jesus Christ, we probably should too. We probably should too. I, um, my mom, my mom turned 80. My mom is my hero. My dad uh, stands as the hero of my life. My dad just getting bigger and bigger every year goes by. And uh, my mom told me the other day she lives in kind of a, 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 an assisted senior living uh, place. And um, she said, she said, Andy, we, we have Bible studies every Monday night and I'm leading them. And I said, well, mom, now, now you're 80 years old. Shouldn't you be taking a break? I didn't say that to her at all. I said, mom, I didn't even know that, by the way. She didn't tell me that. And she said, I'm leading the Bible study. And I said, Mom, get them. Tell them. Lead it. And my mom, at 80 years old, there's a pastor who comes in. And my mom wants to spar with him. Because he's not preaching truth. She calls me all the time. Hey, he said this. I mean, is, do I have this right? Yeah, that's what the Bible says. Well, she's like, okay, I'm going to go to war with that guy, you know. <laughs> My mom, you know, and, and, and I say that kind of in jest, you get the idea. My mom has been an example to me to never stop. Amen. Don't stop. By the way, Dr. Clayton, we are privileged to have our founding pastor. I think it's such a treasure as a church that, that the current pastor and our founding pastor can be friends and love one another. Not every church is that way. And... Um, uh, I'm so grateful that they're here. I love them to death. By the way, they're, they're 85, 86. He, they're not here today. They're skipping church. <laughs> I don't know exactly, but most of the time when they're not here, they're out somewhere else. Yeah. Or, or, or they're really struggling with their health. Dr. Clayton told me last week, we're going to be out next week. So we're going to be out preaching. <laughs> How old are you again? I was like, I, I don't even make your age. Hopefully I can have make your age still have a mind about me to share the gospel. I mean, at what point do we stop? But I just want to kind of throw this out there. I'm going to walk on some thin ice here. I think we're, we kind of have a little bit of a dilemma in America because we're, we're kind of pre-wired to think that at some point we just retire. And, and evidently at 65, we just quit serving God too. I'm not talking to my brother. I asked him, I've been a little while back. He, he's 55, 56 now. And I said, so what are, you, what are you thinking about retirement? He looked at me like, what? He's like, I'm not retiring. I'm going to work until I just die. I was like, you're crazy. I don't plan to do that. I said, well, yeah, let me qualify that. Let me qualify that. If I retire from full-time pastoral work, I'll just do pastoral work on retirement. Is that right? You see, you should look at retirement in your physical world. You should look at retirement as a greater opportunity to serve and work for God. That's what that should be. Now, I don't know, maybe you don't like that. I don't know. And I'm not at retirement yet. By the way, I don't have all the pains that some of you have. I don't have some of the health issues some of you deal with, and I, I get that. I get memory issues, and I get health issues, and I get pain, and I get some of that. But, but here's the thing. God didn't say, he didn't say, continue to work until pain is too great for you. And by the way, the work that you're doing at 70 may look a little different than when you were 30, but that's okay. But don't stop working for the Lord. Don't stop. Is there an amen to that? 
So continue working for the duration of time. I just feel like if God's going to do it, maybe we should too. How about our fourth point? I need to hurry here. Fourth point. Continue to build for reward. For reward. Look at verse 14, 15. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Notice here. But he himself shall be saved. Yet so as by fire. You see, the judges of Christ is about reward or the loss of reward. Suffering loss is not you losing you. It's not you losing your salvation or losing your place in heaven. It's about you losing the potential reward that God had designed for you. God said, now you're going to get a reward or you're not. By the way, let me throw this out there here now. God is not a fan of everybody getting a participation ribbon. <laughs> My generation determined, you know what? We just don't want our kids who finished last in the baseball league to not get a trophy. So we'll give them a participation award. You with me on that? Some of y'all might have got one of those participation awards. Well, you might as well throw it in the trash because if you finish last, you don't deserve it. <laughs> Come on now, is that right or not? If your baseball team stinks, you don't deserve a trophy. And if you can't hit the ball, you don't deserve to play. In Jesus' name. <laughs> You see, God's not a fan of participation uh, ribbons. Hey, thanks for playing, but you didn't do it the way I said to do it, so you don't get reward. That's why John said, I don't want him to show up and me be ashamed. Whew. And the idea that we would do it for reward, by the way, nothing wrong with reward being a motive. God makes it very clear. Nothing wrong with reward being a motive. But, but let's understand, the Bible makes it very clear. The Bible speaks of five crowns in Scripture. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of them, right? The crown of rejoicing, the crown of life, uh, the, the shepherd's crown, the, 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 the crown of righteousness, and the crown of endurance. The, the idea that we would have uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, James chapter 1, verse 12, 1, Thessalonians, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Uh, they're, they're all over the 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. Uh, they're all over the Scripture. The crowns of Scripture that God says they will be given to you as an award. But the crowns are very definitive. He that endures gets a crown of life, James 1.12. He that, I would simply say, walks in the Spirit gets an incorruptible crown, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He that loves his appearing gets a crown of righteousness, 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 8. You see, they're, they're kind of qualified by God. We don't get to say, well, I think the crown of life is this, or the crown, the shepherd's crown is this, or the crown of rejoicing is this. We don't get to define that. God makes it very clear that he's the one who has defined good works. And he says, now, if you want to work that kind of work, you're going to get rewards for that. You're going to get crowns. But here's the thing about the crowns. They are not left for our enjoyment for eternity. Well, what I mean by that is, Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 10 spells it out that we're going to take those very same crowns at some point and cast them at the feet of Jesus at his throne. Amen. By the way, uh, no matter how many crowns you get, no matter how many rewards, we have a motive here today to build with a reward in mind, a crown that God says now you're going to have the privilege of taking that same crown and placing it at the feet of Jesus on the throne of God in heaven to come. Probably don't tell me for a minute that when I put my crown at the feet of Christ, I'm going to be like, yes, sir, look what I did. Woo! Our best player on the baseball team. Not one ounce of that. Amen. It's going to be, hey, look at my great and fearful and wonderful God. Look at how majestic he is. You see, the motive for reward is not really for yourself. The motive for reward is that we might give honor and glory back to God when the time comes. And I don't want to stand before God empty handed. I want to be able to give a crown back to the Lord. So do it for reward. 
Do it with the right motive. Do it for the right purpose. Whatsoever you do, it all to the glory of God. And not unto men, the Bible teaches. We come to a fifth point, really simple. Build with hope. Verse 15 mentions we have the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit. Verse 16 talks about being the temple of God. You know one thing about church that today is under attack by Satan himself is that the church, and I'm talking about not a building, I'm not talking about some schedule or some you know, particular program, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people. Satan has planted the seed in the minds of the world that the church, the people of God, are not really able to make a difference. So many people today say stuff like this. I've heard it so often. Well, I don't really need church. I love God, but I don't like church. You know what that statement simply means? We love God. We want to love God, but we are sick and tired of all the politics and all the Phariseeism in church. We're tired of the high church. We're tired of, you know, seating charts. We're tired of the who's who. Right? We're tired of the who's who. We're, we're, we're tired of the fake Christianity. I'm tired of people that call themselves leadership. I'm sick and tired of people who say they are leaders in the church who are ill motive and cause damage in people's lives. Starting with preachers. And we're sick and tired of this thing called church that in the end we don't believe in anymore. Well, here's the thing about that. Here's the thing about that. The one fundamental truth is that, read, read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 through 26. We just looked at it in Sunday school this morning. Because God in His choice has chosen people, i.e. me and you, and every other believer, to make a difference in the world in which we live. Now what that means is we have a little bit of hope. What that means is that we can become righteous, empowered, righteous examples of Christ with the people that we know. Uh, let, me, let me rephrase that. What that means is in order to become righteous and an example of Christ, at some point we have to decide, I am sick and tired of sin in my life. I am sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of, a, of, a, of an ill-motive heart. I'm sick and tired of a spirit of judgment in my own life where I can't come to the doors of the church without looking with, with slanted eyes at everybody else. I'm sick and tired of having a foul mouth. I'm sick and tired of having evil thoughts. Now, by the way, we're not going to perfect that. That'll never completely go away. But at some point, we have to say, I am tired of that, and I'm going to give my heart to God that God can do a work in me to make me who He wants me to be. So I, uh, I am just greedy. Well, then ask God to fix it. And stop being greedy. Here's, way, an, uh, here's an antidote for greediness. Give more. So I just don't believe in prayer. You want an antidote for that? Get on your knees and tell God about it. And God will fix that issue. So I just don't think God can use me. Read the Bible. Hello? So I just don't think God can use me. Read the Bible. I mean, who, who was Noah? Who was David? A little ruddy kid out in the pasture with some sheep and he took down a giant. I mean, who's David? Who is Daniel? But an insignificant man. Who is Abraham? But some, some guy in a far country that God chose to bring his nation through. I mean, who are any of these people? Who is Moses that gave him every excuse why God could not use him? Who is Gideon that threw every fleece in every which direction waiting for God to change his mind? Come on now, is that right? I mean, who was Victor Sears? He has no idea. He's passed away a long time ago. He's been in heaven for a long time. That man has no idea what kind of influence God used him to make in my life. Who are you? You're just an insignificant shepherd out in the pasture. You're a no-name person out in the back country somewhere 
that God has chosen you to do something great. Who are you? You're nothing but a kid. You're nothing but a kid that God can use to bring down a giant. Uh, who are you? But, but some pagan woman that God can choose to bring his son through. Ruth, who are you? Well, you're a sinful king. So I'm in a place of leadership, place of influence. Yeah, but you're an insignificant leader unless God is leading your life. Come on now, is that right? See, do it with hope. Because God has given you something bigger than you. It's called His Holy Spirit. And He's given you something greater than you. It's called His church, His temple. A place to serve Him in, a place to serve Him with power, and a place to serve Him with attitude and motive for His honor and for His glory. And there's no retirement. Continue. Continue on. Don't stop. Say, Brother Andy, where do I get involved? Well, you just find a way to get involved. We'll help you. And by the way, you don't have to have a title or a position to get involved. Get on your knees. Get on your knees and pray. My mom was a prayer warrior. My mom told me the other day, I, I want to brag on my mom for just one more second. Her pastor and wife went to Israel. My mom attends a church of about 500. And uh, pastor and wife went to Israel. And my, my mom showed me the other day a, a prayer shawl 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 that from israel that the pastor's wife brought back from my mom she showed it to me it's beautiful it's mom that's and it just kind of hit me i was like well mom so did the pastor's wife get one of these for everybody she says no so she got it for me because i am her prayer warrior and she knows that i about fell down in the room right there as a mom how much greater work can you do how much more can you do? By the way, mom, pray for the pastor's wife. My mom was on her knees all the time. Mom, lead a Bible study. You give it to them. In Jesus' name, with kindness and, and grace, but give it to them. Mom, go to Sunday school and make a difference. She said, Andy, I said, well, I've been in my Sunday school class and everybody's dying. I said, well, mom, you just keep going. Love them all. By the way, my mom is insignificant. My mom is just a regular old person who puts her clothes on and her shoes on like everybody else. Continue in the work. Let's do it together. Let's do it with love. Let's do it with grace. And let's do it in honor of our great Savior, Jesus Christ. Is that an amen? amen. Father, we are so grateful this morning, Father, to be able to call upon your name. Father, our time has gone long today, yet we're impressed, Lord, with the challenge of continuing in your name. Father, help us today. Help us today to make the decision. Father, maybe it needs to be a choice of materials. Maybe we need to be reminded of the foundation of which to build. Father, help us to do it for reward and for the long term. And Father, help us to do it with hope. We believe, Lord. We believe in what you can do in and through us. And Lord, now, now where we're short, where we're having trouble this morning, Lord, move in our hearts. Help us to respond to you. Help us to run to your throne. And Lord, help us not to hesitate. Now is a time of response. We pray this will be in your name and in your honor. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.